Okay, this is the video lecture for microbiology for biology majors. This would substitute for the lecture that was missed on Thursday, the 17th of January. And this is the first of two lectures. Um, I want to go back one slide because we're talking about phage. Phage are just viruses that infect bacteria. And um, if you look at phage, they have a different, they're uh, more of a complex capsid structure, and um, they have different forms. There are different forms. Some are DNA viruses, some are RNA viruses. Um, and when they infect bacteria, say uh, things like streptococcus and staphylococcus, they're often more pathogenic to humans because they donate genetic material for pathogenicity directly to the bacteria that infect humans. So uh, if we look at how a phage can infect a host, um, this shows that you can have either a lytic state where the bacteria get infected and then they lyse, or they can have a lysogenic state where the bacteria get infected and the viral DNA uh, becomes a prophage. Okay, so we start up here with E. coli host. Uh, the phage injects its DNA, so you get viral DNA. And uh, so the actual capsid doesn't penetrate the cell. It just forms a dock with the base plate of the virus and injects the viral DNA. Uh, the phage will duplicate then the different components, the capsimer, um, capsimers, the uh, DNA then. And then after that, they'll start to self-assemble. And so you get new virus particles, and this assembles into quite a uh, complicated structure. Oops, didn't want to do that. Let me go back and back. Okay. And uh, then the phage mature. And as they mature, then the cell wall weakens and then lyses, and that releases new viruses. Okay. Now, an alternative pathway is the DNA can just become a prophage where it becomes a portion of the bacterial genome. The bacterial genome mostly consists of one chromosome. And so the phage DNA just incorporates directly into that chromosome. And then whenever that bacteria divides, then it's also producing phage. Um, so this can, de this can duplicate directly, uh, but it can also lie latent and just have portions of this little genome uh, uh, transcribed and translated. And when you have lysogenic state, then that's where you get more infective forms of things like streptococcus um, because of the phage DNA that are located on the bacterial genome. Okay. Uh, it, the, there are different types of phage. They all have different uh, components and um, names. T even phage are uh, infective to bacteria. Okay, they have an icosahedral capsid, but they also have the docking mechanism. So they look a little bit like a spider to deliver the DNA only. So the virus doesn't have to uncoat. Once, it's, once a virus is assembled within the cytoplasm of the bacterial cell, then it's locked solid. It doesn't uncoat. Uh, it has a docking mechanism that can just inject the DNA directly into the cell. Okay, and then parts within the host cell um, will self-assemble to form new phage. Okay, it looks something like this. The head is icosahedral, and then you have um, a tube that protrudes through the cell wall and cell membrane, and that's where the nucleic acid is delivered. Okay, it looks something like this. Here's um, uh, phage that are infecting E. coli, and you can see that not only have a lot of phage infected this E. coli cell, but there are phage that are forming within E. coli that once that cell bursts, then they'll be liberated. Okay, a lysogenic state is for phages that um, don't necessarily undergo replication or release immediately. They just inject their DNA and then that DNA becomes a portion of the bacterial uh, chromosome. Okay, so we call that a prophage. So a prophage is where the bacteria is uh, actually incorporated the viral DNA. Um, and we also call that uh, lysogeny. So a lysogenic state or a prophage state um, is, they're basically synonymous. 
okay? And that allows the virus to spread. It also allows the bacteria to acquire traits from the virus, and that allows the virus to spread without killing the host cell, okay? In human diseases, these phage genes will produce toxins that are, make, that are much more pathogenic to humans. So you'll find that there are bacterial strains that just over time have incorporated these phage uh, in their genomes and they create a pathogenic state, okay? So when a bacteria becomes lysogenic, we call that a lysogenic conversion, and it's just acquiring a trait from the phage. So some gene from the phage is responsible for a toxin that's being produced. Uh, diphtheria toxin or uh, Clostridia diphtheriae, uh, which causes diphtheria, which is a real rare disease. You don't see that really much in the United States. Vibrio cholerae for a cholera, uh, has phage DNA in it. And then botulism toxin, um, you hear Botox. Well, the toxin from botulism that causes this paralysis is actually from a phage. It's not in C. botulinum itself, uh, but uh, that Botox gene was acquired from a phage, okay? And um, there are a lot of applications where you need to grow viruses in the laboratory. Um, sometimes you're just identifying viruses in a clinical specimen, say if it's a rare virus and you want to grow a lot of it, then you'll provide some type of medium, uh, which is nutritious for viruses. You have to provide some type of host cells like animal cells and culture. Uh, also, you need to prepare viruses uh, like poliovirus or chickenpox virus for vaccines. And then there are other applications where you just need to do research on viral structure uh, the multiplication cycle of viruses or the genetics of viruses, just so you understand viral disease and how viral disease spreads. So you may need a lot of virus particles for that type of research. Uh, one of the easiest ways to generate a lot of virus particles is just inoculate the animals. And uh, when you use uh, animals um, that are closely related to humans, and you can also produce antibodies to these viruses, and the antibodies may be active in humans, okay? So they can detect human viruses. Um, occasionally, insects are used. Insects' immune system is um, uh, varied. It's much different than the human immune system, so it's not good for producing antibodies. But if you want to produce a lot of viruses, then you can use an insect cell, okay? Sometimes non-human primates are used, but only very rarely. Um, for production of vaccines, especially uh, for the flu vaccine, they'll use bird embryos. And the egg itself provides a protective case. Uh, and different portions of the embryo or the uh, fluids and compartments associated with the embryo are good for viral propagation. Okay, so you can see here's a, a chicken egg. And uh, different portions are really good for um, inoculating viruses and growing lots of virus particles. Uh, uh, one of the things that does happen in this instance is you'll have the virus mutate. Uh, chicken eggs are a great place for viruses to mutate and they may mutate in a fashion that you would not see in humans. And that this makes the, the vaccine less effective. But you can see um, Allen Towick inoculation for different viruses. Uh, some go directly into the yolk sac. Uh, some go into the amniotic fluid, and some go directly into the chorioanalytic uh, and uh, allantoic membrane. So they will be incorporated into the membrane. So membrane-bound viruses are good for that particular region. Uh, to grow viruses, you can do this in cell culture. Uh, so you just take animal cells, uh, like some of the fibroblasts that uh, Trent has grown in his laboratory. You grow them in a tea flask in monoleo culture. And then you take the primary cells. Uh, this is the first round of culture after the cells are taken from the animal. And then you may transform them by infecting them with a virus like the Epstein-Barr virus. Um, it, and what this causes is an altered morphology and an altered chromosome number. Um, cells that grow in culture 
are not the same as cells that grow in human tissues or animal tissues. And so you have to be very aware of that, okay? Uh, flu vaccines still made in eggs. I, I stand on my contention that they're made in eggs, but they're also routinely made in animal cell culture and insect cell culture. Those are a little bit better because the viruses tend not to mutate uh, as rapidly in those uh, substrates. Okay. Uh, once a mammalian cell or an insect cell has been infected, it lyses and it forms what's called a plaque. And this plaque is just a circular clearing in the culture, and you will find that circular clearing teeming with virus particles. It looks something like this. Um, this is where the, the cells have been stained blue, the substrate has been stained blue, and you can see the regions of clearing. That's when the cells have died. Uh, and these clearings are called plaques. And if you just take a little pipette and get some of the fluid from the plaques, then you'll find many, many virus particles. Um, viral infections, we don't see these as much, especially dengue fever and yellow fever, you don't see in the United States, but Rift Valley fever, you do, okay? Rabies and Ebola viruses are near, nearly always fatal. And then uh, those that uh, cause long-term debilitation are polio and neonatal rubella. When a baby gets has rubella very, very young, that, that can cause things like cataracts and also cause developmental issues. Uh, polio causes paralysis in a very, very few cases. Most people that get polio don't even realize it. About 94% of the cases are asymptomatic and only a fraction of the cases that do have symptoms do lead to paralysis. Okay, here's a uh, insect vector. Um, for things like Rift Fever or West Nile virus, okay? Uh, here's somebody that has um, yellow fever, and yellow fever is called yellow fever because it creates a lot of jaundice. So there's yellow discoloration of the eyes and skin, okay? Here is a uh, baby that had congenital rubella syndrome, and you can see a cataract there on the baby's uh, left eye. Okay, and um, we cover prions in microbiology, but prions are not living. Prions are just proteins. Uh, they are proteinaceous infectious particles, and they transmit a misfolded state that causes disease. So when you have a prion, it will actually recruit other proteins. It will cause the proteins to misfold. And then those misfolded proteins go and recruit other proteins. And so in that way, it's an infectious disease, but it's not infectious by cells or viruses. It's just proteins that exist already in the body that are being recruited to become misfolded. Okay, uh, the human variant of mad cow disease is called Crutchfield-Jacobs disease. And it causes a progression that's a lot like Alzheimer's disease. It causes nervous system damage, brain damage, um, only the progression is much more quickly uh, recognized than Alzheimer's. Uh, bovine spongiform encephalopathy is just mad cow disease. And one of the things about prions is when you have prion contamination, usually whatever is contaminated has to be completely incinerated. Um, they've done this where they have taken cattle who were infected and they incinerate the cattle as well as all of the cattle within a certain radius of that contaminated cow, okay? And the way that uh, prions work here, we've got prions which are in red and uh, they will actually interact with non-prionic proteins in green and they, they misfold and they cause misfolding in the non-prionic proteins uh, that will cause a conversion of the non-prion, the green one, to the red one. And so you always have these prions in waiting that can be converted to prions. They exist in normal human cells. And when they're converted to prions, then that's when they start to accumulate and cause damage. You can also have spontaneous mutation. One of these green uh, proteins can spontaneously mutate and form a prionic form. So uh, this doesn't have, has to happen uh, by infection, it can happen just on its own, okay? And you'll notice that the prions that are in waiting that are non-prionic have a superscript C for uh, control. 
And then those that are prionic have a superscript SC. That stands for scrapie, which is one of the first diseases that was recognized as a prion disease. Okay, other types of infectious par particles you can get, uh, just little pieces of DNA. Um, these are satellite viruses, and they can only replicate if the cell has already been infected by a virus, like an adeno-associated virus, uh, a company is an adenovirus, or a delta agent, which is a very small virus, um, a company is hepatitis B, and if you have the delta agent, then the, the disease is much more aggressive and can cause damage to your liver. There are also what are called viriods. And these are small viruses that are just single strands of RNA, just naked strands of RNA. They're difficult to decontaminate because they're so small and they infect plants. There are lots of different drugs that can be used uh, to combat viruses. And they will target some portion of the virus's life cycle. They will block replication of the DNA. They'll block release from the cells, but something that will cause the virus to shorten its or curtail its life cycle so it can't replicate. Um, AZT, which is azitothymidine, uh, is used for uh, HIV AIDS treatment. It's a nucleic acid analog and it blocks DNA elongation. So uh, it looks like thymine. And so when it incorporates in the place where thymine incorporates, then no other uh, nucleic acid can join it. So it just blocks um, DNA duplication right in its path. And so the virus can't replicate. Okay. Um, integrase inhibitors, these are uh, protease inhibitors. They prevent the HIV DNA from incorporating into the host cell DNA. So once HIV has converted its RNA to DNA, then um, these inhibitors prevent that DNA portion from integrating into the human genome. Okay. And then another one is called interferon. Uh, these are naturally uh, pro produced proteins in humans. We produce a small amount of interferon as our immune response all the time. And this signals the immune system defenses, uh, but it can be made and you can get it in very, very large quantities, much larger than physiological quantities uh, through recombinant DNA drugs. Okay. And that is the end of chapter six. Uh, see, I'm going to take a little break here and then we'll move forward. We're going to go and review chapters four and five. Okay, the next thing I want to do is just a brief discussion of chapters four and five. Uh, this is a lot of the detailed information in chapters four and five is really review for you. It's review of cell and molecule. It's a lot of cell biology, but I want to go over the basic structures of the cell just so we have some type of basis, uh, especially with prokaryotic cell structure. You may have not gone through that in more detail. Of course, prokaryotes, do not have organelles <clears throat> and um, they don't have a true nucleus. Eukaryotes do have organelles and they do have a true nucleus. Okay, so if we want to look at prokaryotic cell structure, uh, here's a cross section of a prokaryotic cell. And so what you see here um, is the inside of the cell or the cytoplasm. Okay. And um, I think it'd probably be easiest if I just go through these uh, directly. The cytoplasm is down here. Uh, this is just a gelatinous water-based solution, and it has the entire cell in it. Okay. Um, the cell can, and we'll see this in laboratory next week, the cell can form spores, what are called endospores. These are dormant bodies. And they're formed within some bacteria um, under harsh conditions. And it's just a survival mechanism where the cell usually it starts out as a rod shape and it will form a circular dormant body that um, when the spore is formed, then it will be able to last for a long period of time without moisture and also last high temperature conditions or without nutrition. Um, I'll show you a later slide that shows how spores are formed. Um, the outer membrane is not 
in all cells of the outer membrane. Make a note of this is only in gram negative cells. Oh, by the way, these slides are on Moodle. I just posted these slides on Moodle. So if you want to follow along, you can follow along with those slides. The outer membrane is only in gram negative cells and it contains a surface molecule called lipopolysaccharide. And this lipopolysaccharide, when infecting humans, causes fever and shock. So if somebody has a gram-negative infection, you have to be very careful with that. Beneath this, uh, the outer membrane, uh, closest to the cytoplasm, is the cell membrane. Uh, sometimes we call that the inner membrane, and it's just a phospholipid membrane. It's, uh, it's got lipids, and then it has proteins, integral membrane proteins, and peripheral membrane proteins that control the flow of materials in and outside the cell. Uh, outside of the cell membrane is a cell wall. Uh, this is made out of a compound called peptidoglycan. It's part protein and it's part sugar. And the cell wall provides rigidity. It also has some type of some flexibility. It has uh, the protein portion is glycine rich, which is like a protein spring. And so it is semi-rigid, it allows some flexibility of the cell. Uh, you'll also find in the cell some inclusion bodies, okay? And inclusion bodies are single membrane structured. And this is where nutrition and waste products um, can be deposited in, and uh, these inclusion bodies then will um, uh, store these materials for later use. It's a single membrane structure, so it's not technically an organelle. An organelle is a double membrane structure, okay? If it's a granule, a granule has no membrane, and usually that's for storage of inorganic materials. You'll also see inclusion bodies uh, when you have a genetically modified cell and it's producing lots of proteins. Typically, the bacterial cell doesn't know what to do with those proteins. It doesn't recognize them for use. And so we'll put the proteins in an inclusion body. Okay, I'm gonna skip over here. Uh, talk about the chromosome. Uh, the chromosomal region in the bacterial cell is called a nucleoid. It's not separated from the cytoplasm, so there is no membrane around it. It's usually a single chromosome, single circular chromosome. And in addition to this, you have smaller circular DNA called plasmids. And these plasmids, um, are double-stranded DNA circles, and they can be exchanged between both gram-negative and gram-positive cells via conjugation, okay? You also have ribosomes, and ribosomes are in every type of cell. These are uh, molecules. They're not, if you learn anything from this class, please learn that ribosomes are not organelles. They're molecules that are part protein, part RNA, and they are the protein production factories. They grab onto messenger RNA and they use it to produce protein. Okay, so ribosomes are usually visible if you have a high power microscope, say an electron microscope, and you can see these just free floating in the cytoplasm. Okay, uh, inside the cell membrane, just below the cell membrane is an actin cytoskeleton. It provides rigidity and structure for the cell membrane. And these are just actin uh, filaments that lie beneath the cell membrane. Okay, and all bacterial cells have an actin cytoskeleton. Now moving to the outside, uh, we have locomotion. Not all bacteria have this. They're called flagella. Okay, flagella plural or flagellum singular. And this is attached directly into the cytoplasm uh, through the cell membrane and the cell wall. And the bacterial flagellum is usually in a coil and it moves like a propeller, it moves in a coil and it provides motility, okay? Also, you have uh, a coating called a glycocalyx. This is just the pink coating outside of the outer membrane. And this glycocalyx is uh, primarily polysaccharide. It also contains protein. Um, it can be very tight and form a capsule or it can be very loose and diffuse and form what's called a slime layer, okay? And then you have uh, these hair-like structures that are like bristles on the cell. They allow the cells to attach to each other and attach to surfaces. They're basically cell Velcro. They're called fimbriae, okay? And let's see, did I miss anything? Boom, boom, boom. Oh, uh, pilus. Uh, you only see pili, pili is plural, pilus is singular. 
You only see these in gram negative cells. You don't see them in gram positive cells. Um, but this is a hollow tube. It's made of a protein called tubulin. And this allows these plasmids to linearize. Uh, they go from a circular circle to just a straight line. And these plasmids can attach to other bacteria, other gram ne negative bacteria via pillars. And the plasmids can be exchanged. And that way you get genetic diversity just by exchange of plasmids. Okay, so that's the basic structure of a prokaryotic cell. I want to just look at some of these uh, different arrangements. Uh, we'll talk about flagella first. <clears throat> if you have a single flagellum that is just emanating from one pole, we call that monotrichus. If you have multiple flagella that are emanating from one pole, that's called lophotrichus. If you have flagella, single or multiple flagella on either pole, then it's called amphitrichus. And then if you have multiple flagella that are just at random all over the body of the cell, then you have paratrichus. Okay. A, B, and C are polar arrangements. And then paratrichus, the flagella just uh, work. Um, they work in a coordinated fashion, but they come from any portion of the cell. Okay. Here's some different um, flagella. You've got there's monotrichus, here's lophotrichus, and then erwinia is paratrichus. And you can actually see E. coli is generally uh, paratrichus as well. And we'll be able to see these under the microscope when we do flagella staining next week. Okay. The flagella work in a coordinated fashion, even paratrichus, so they will form sort of this braid and they will uh, rotate like a propeller and that will propel the, the bacterial cell along forward. What else can I show you? Um, here are pili, or here's a pilus between two gram negative cells. Um, this will allow for conjugation of plasmid DNA. And this cell is has a pretty prolific uh, set of fimbriae. And this is these are just cell spikes that allow for attachment to surfaces. Okay. Uh, if we look at um, the glycocalyx. The glycocalyx can form either a capsule or a slime layer. And here you see some capsular bacteria down here where you see just sort of a yellow portion around these bacterial rods. And that yellow portion is a tight capsule that is made out of polysaccharides and proteins. And then sometimes um, these can be very diffuse and they can look watery from a macroscopic appearance. And this is just a slime layer. They're not tight like a capsule. And they, but you see slime layer on, say, like on dental plaques, and they prevent the cells from losing water. Okay. Um, they can form biofilms together. Um, this one portion is capsular, and you see it's nice and tight, and this is loose and a little less structured, and that's a slime layer. Okay. Look at the cell wall and the basic structure of the cell wall. There are two carbohydrates. There's uh, a G carbohydrate and an M carbohydrate. The G stands for N-acetylglucosamine, or glucosamine just for short. And the M is N-acetylmuramic acid, or muramic acid for short. And these are linked together uh, by glycoside bonds. And then they're cross-linked to give additional structure by uh, chains that are primarily uh, glycine. Okay, so you have a glycine chain. Here you have uh, two residues of muramic acid, and these muramic acids are hold together, held together by this bridge, okay, that has sort of a spike structure, this tetrapeptide, and then a, um, a pentapeptide, a glycine spring here. And so this type of structure is conserved, and the spring allows for flexibility of the cell wall. Okay. We look at cell wall architecture. I want to look at the difference between a gram positive and a gram negative cell. Uh, a gram positive cell has a very thick wall of peptidoglycan, shown in brown here. Okay. And then a very thin cell membrane below it. Okay. There's no outer membrane in gram positive cells. There's no outer membrane that has lipopolysaccharides. So please remember that. You just have a cell wall, which is peptidoglycan, and a cell membrane, and that's it. Um, for a gram-positive, gram-negative cell, look at how thin the cell wall is. Very thin, very easy to protrude. And then you have a cell membrane in yellow here. 
okay? It's just shown as yellow. And then an outer membrane in green. So the outer membrane contains phospholipids, but it also contains an outer layer of lipopolysaccharide. So if we look at sort of this uh, representation of a gram-negative cell, we have the cell membrane, cell wall is sandwiched in between, and then the outer membrane. And the space between the outer membrane and the cell membrane is called the periplasmic space or the periplasm. Okay, so please remember those architectures between gram-negative and gram-positive cells. Also remember that conjugation can occur. You can exchange plasmids between bacterial cells uh, for both gram-positive and gram-negative. Gram-positive uh, cells will come directly in contact with each other and form a protein bridge to allow plasmids to cross. Gram-negative cells will form a pillus, and that pillus is a structure that goes between the outer membrane of two gram-negative cells, and that allows for conjugation and the plasmid to be exchanged in that fashion. But conjugation does occur in both gram-negative and gram-positive cells. Okay. If we look at the structure of a gram-positive cell in detail, you've got a really large layer of peptidoglycan and then the cell membrane below. If you look at a gram-negative cell, it's a more complex. You've got an inner membrane or cell membrane. Then you've got a very thin layer of peptidoglycan then you have an outer membrane, and on the outside of the outer membrane are these lipopolysaccharides. And those are bad news um, because when you have a gram-negative infection, that lipopolysaccharide uh, interferes with your hypothalamus, and it can cause fever, can cause massive fever, and you can go into shock. Okay. okay, other things that I should show you here. Um, I think... Let's see, I, don't want, I want to make sure I'm not missing anything. Um, here, oh, spore formation. Okay, we need to talk about spore formation. Let me join, figure out where that starts. Okay. An endospore or a spore is just um, a defense mechanism of certain bacteria, okay, and where they will form dormant bodies to withstand harsh conditions. Okay. This is produced by Bacillus clostridium and Sporos harcina. And when a cell is just happy and growing and has a lot of nutrition, we call it a vegetative cell. So these are not spores. It, they, they have plenty of water, they have plenty of nutrition, and they're growing in a favorable environment. But when you change that environment to an unfavorable state, say you lose nutrition, you lose water, or you get intense heat, then these vegetative cells will start to sporulate. Okay. Uh, can happen in gram-negative or gram-positive cells. And uh, gram-positive spores are more medically relevant. You don't see very many medically relevant gram-negative infections. Okay. And uh, the way that we do this in a laboratory, we're going to generate some spores next week, is just to deplete the nutrients, uh, especially depleting carbon resources and nitrogen resources then you can simulate spores within about 24 hours, okay? And so here you have just a spore forming as a vegetative cell with a nucleoid. Um, one, the nucleoid will divide and form one uh, sporangiospore or sporangium. That sporangium will wall off. It continues to wall off. And then here, the sporangium is just the nucleic acid and it forms a hardened shell called a prospore, okay? then the, uh, the uh, cell wall or the spore wall will tend to get more thick, okay? It will become mature, and when it becomes mature, the vegetative cell around it starts to die, okay? Then it becomes a free spore, and that will list, that, that can last for thousands of years. The free spore is essentially dormant. It doesn't need nutrition. And however, if you rehydrate these, you add nutrients in water, then they will germinate, and so you'll get budding off of the spore here, and then they'll ultimately become a vegetative cell again. So you can store spores for long periods of time. Okay. Uh, anthrax is, uh, comes from a bacteria called Bacillus anthracis. Um, skin anthrax, if you get this into a cut or a wound, will cause a very, very nasty infection. Inhaled anthrax, where you inhale the spores, which are light and they can be, become airborne very easily, 
um, inhaled anthrax can be lethal and causes pneumonia and it can become lethal. Uh, tetanus, uh, spores will form in the environment. Uh, this is an anaerobic bacterium. So when it is in the presence of oxygen, it will form spores. But as soon as you get like a deep wound, then in that deep wound, then the, the tetanus spores can reform vegetative cells. Okay, tetanus is actually a very rare disease. You get about seven to 10 cases per year in the United States. Okay, uh, gas gangrene from Clostridium perfringens. Okay, again, Clostridium is anaerobic and so it forms spores until it um, gets in an anaerobic environment and then it will thrive. Okay. So how would spore formation affect disease prevalence? Well, if you can form a spore, the spore can uh, exist and persist. And it's much more difficult to get rid of with things like disinfectant. You really have to autoclave spores in order to get rid of them. And so they persist in the environment more readily than uh, vegetative bacteria. And so once you have an outbreak of spores in a hospital environment, then they can spread very rapidly. They're also light and airborne, so they can be spread by the wind and, and uh, you have to be very careful in windy soil. Uh, clust Clostridium botulinum causes botulism. Okay. And spores will resist normal cleaning methods. Um, the, back, the cleaner that we use in the laboratory back down is a spore side, so it will, re, uh, will uh, cause spores to die. Okay. So you can get rid of spores um, using certain disinfectants, but the best way to get rid of spores is to autoclave them. When you provide heat and moisture together, then the combination of heat and moisture and moisture will soften up the spore walls, cause the spores to explode, and so you can get rid of them. And here's some example of uh, different spores. This is uh, Bacillus anthracis, and the spores are not dyed here. The vegetative cells are dyed, but the spores are left white. Okay, so you can see some spores within vegetative cells, and you can see some free spores. Okay, here's an anthrax surface wound. Okay, and it causes necrosis of the skin, so the skin will just die off. Uh, this can, anthrax can be treated with antibiotics. Uh, here's Clostridium tetani, and you see that the spores are located at the end of the vegetative cells. They look like little sperm, uh, but these spores will become free spores, and they will persist in the environment. Somebody that has tetanus, um, the advanced stages of tetanus, you get severe muscle damage. Uh, the muscles then start to contract. Uh, in a state of contraction is very painful, uh, but tetanus is, can be caught in its early stages and it's readily treated with antibiotics. Um, here's Clostridium perfringens. It's more difficult to see the spores in this slide, but you can see a few. Uh, causes gas being green here. And then it's just Clostridium botulinum. The spores are actually causing the cells to swell here. Okay. And botulism is a toxin, and we talked about this in chapter six. Uh, it's actually lysogenic. It gets its uh, toxin from a phage that infects botulism. And it causes, you get this sort of droopy eyelid effect if you uh, get uh, botulism uh, food poisoning. And that's this, it's just a paralysis of the muscles. And it's the same thing that's in Botox, only here it's more systemic. And so this person can't lift their eyelids because they're paralyzed. Um, and uh, this will pass, uh, can be treated with antibiotics. Okay, and so that is our nice little section on spores. Uh, let's see, what, uh, what else do we wanna talk about here? Just giving you a buffet. Um, oh, shapes and arrangements of cells. Okay, here's a good slide to study. Oh, I'm only picking a few, a few slides for you to look at. Uh, out of chapter four, but if you want to look at the different arrangements of cells, so this slide here um, has the different shapes. You've got three basic shapes. You've got coccus, bacillus, and then spiral forms. Okay, spiral forms can be curved rods or vibrio. Uh, they can be flexible, rigid spirals with flagella called spirilla, or they can be flexible spirals that have internal flagella, 
and we call these spirochetes. Okay. Caucus um, can be in pairs, diplococcus, four, tetrads, sarsini, when they're packed in cubic structure. They can be in chain, which we call strepto, or they can be in clusters, which we call staphylo. Rods can be pill-shaped, or they can be uh, more oval, which we call cacobacilli. Okay, they can be irregular, and they can attach uh, in a hinged fashion. These hinges are called palisades. Okay, they can form spores, and you do see some different structures. The, these almost look like fungus, although they are bacteria. Um, and the rods form filaments, and then they'll actually form cocci in the end that are like little buds. So terms to remember, bacillus, caucus, librio, spirillum, or a spirilla is a spiral with a flagella. It's a rigid spiral. Spirochete is a spiral spring. It's flexible. Okay. And if the cells can change shape, if they're shapeshifters, we call that pliomorphism. Uh, two cocci or diplococci. Tetrad is a packet of four cocci. Sarcinia are when you have cubic arrangements of eight, 16, or 32 cells. Staphylococci is irregular clumps of cocci. Staphylo basically means cluster. Strepto is a chain. Okay. Palisades arrangements are hinged. Okay, and you can see some different shapes and arrangements here of different bacterial cells. Diplococci, bacillus, streptococci, vibrio. Okay, um, and we're not going to talk about taxonomy. I think you've had lots of taxonomy, so I'm going to um, just kind of go on and see what else is interesting here. Ba, 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 ba. Okay, now um, what I'll do at this particular point, it's about 45 minutes into this lecture, so I'll start next time. Uh, I'm going to do another video lecture, which I'll post on YouTube, and for that video lecture, we will look at Chapter 5, and if we're done with just highlights of Chapter 5, which are eukaryotic cells, which you've had a lot already, then we'll move on to Chapter 7. Okay, so that concludes this video lecture.